I, I came across this, and it's not showing up very well, but this was uh, considered to be the first experiment approach to fuel in the U.S. Uh, in the late 18, or early 1800s, this gentleman built in Philadelphia a room, insulated it on the outside, put a stove in it, burned the fuel to keep the temperature at the constant temperature, and then saw how long it took for the fuel to burn out. And by this, he rated fuel, uh, most three of it's wood, and one of it is anthracite coal. Uh, this was what really happened in the U.S. during the 1800s as far as fuel science. It was trying to rate fuel so that you could sell coal, wood, whatever, and little science into the uh, fuel science. It was mostly rating fuels. Uh, this is beginning of Bureau of Mines. I, at the St. Louis Exposition in 1904, and this was greatly publicized, it was heavily science oriented. Uh, they started rating fuels and this led to forming the Bureau of Mines in seven years. So that from this, the uh, Bureau of Mines was formed in uh, 1911. <clears throat> uh, this indicates they were pretty independent. Uh, that uh, each one operated, headed by a chief who did whatever he wanted to do and didn't talk to other chiefs. And so uh, it was more or less a bureau of mines, but it really was independent laboratories. I, when they started out, uh, sin fuels was not a topic. This list of topics that were considered to be worked on in 1911 and uh, nothing to do with fuels. <clears throat> by the 1920s, and this is from a paper by Herman Pines, UOP at least was concerned, as were many in the U.S., about the supply of oil. Uh, I.G. Farben and Standard of New Jersey, which is now ExxonMobil, uh, and Standard of Jersey had Western rights to the heavy oil hydrogenation, a lot of the Fisher Tropes technology that developed, a lot of coal liquefaction. And we're providing money to support IG Farm. I, the direct and indirect coal liquefaction had been announced in Germany. UOP set out to develop expertise in catalysis. Up to that point, it had been thermal cracking and legal action with every oil company in the world. Uh, one of the things maybe sometimes you shouldn't win because in the 30s UOP won the lawsuit and then six companies decided it was cheaper to buy the company than to pay the royalty they now had to pay, so they bought UOP. So they won the lawsuit and lost their freedom. Uh, Egeloff, who was a strong proponent of petroleum, uh, wore a synthetic clothing in the 1930s, far ahead of his time, was known as gasoline dust. Uh, he recruited a Padiev who had left Ger uh, Russia and was in Germany at the time, and a Padiev did much to develop the high octane gasoline. Also recruited Troch, but he only stayed there for a few years. And at UOP, he didn't work on Fisher Tropes, he worked on catalytic cracking. Uh, this is R.B. Anderson's version. Uh, when I organized a meeting in honor of Paul Emmett, I thought he was going to write the uh, outline of the Bureau of Mines, but uh, Bob Anderson liked the nitrated iron, or nitrided <coughs> iron catalyst, and so he wrote the paper on iron nitride as a Fisher Tropes catalyst, and so I had to plead with him to write a two page summary of the Bureau of Mines. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, there was a little work on catalysis. Uh, the big thing was Henry Storch being recruited to come from New Jersey to Pittsburgh. Uh, then in 1943, they started. Uh, this uh, Norma Golombic uh, did much to translate German documents that are now on the web with uh, Centrolium. Uh, and uh, a 
Hawk and Brown, who had worked earlier. Hoffer started working on carbides of iron. And this, if you want to get a basic start, is where you should go. This is a picture of Bob Anderson uh, studying the program at the International Catalyst Meeting in Berlin in 1984, I think it is. Uh, in 1944, uh, Bob Anderson came there. Uh, before that, he'd been working on gas mask charcoal at uh, Johns Hopkins with Paul Emmett. Uh, Saul Weller only worked on Fisher Tropes for a short time. Uh, it really should be Anderson uh, Weller uh, Schultz Flory because Weller came up with a similar equation to Anderson. Uh, they were working in small pilot plant at Brewston. Uh, these are the ones who were responsible for the pilot plant. Uh, Benson and Field were major uh, contributors to the development of oil recirculation and the hot gas recycle process that were worked on extensively at the Bureau of Mines. And Schlesinger was uh, responsible for FPS and slurry phase at the Bureau of Mines. Uh, he was also in charge of fluid bed reactors and live bed typing. Uh, Actually, he came there with experience in fluid bed reactors because he was at Kellogg before this and had worked on Kellogg's uh, fluid bed reactors, which uh, eventually became Sassol's fluid bed reactors. Uh, it worked much better for catalytic fracking than it did pressure tropes when Kellogg had it in the 40s and 50s. Uh, organic chemistry. Uh, was first under Milton Orchin and then under Irving Winder. Uh, both of these contributed heavily to understanding the catalysis of cobalt in solution and for developing the mechanistic understanding of hydroformylation with cobalt catalysts. And Irving Winder is one of the people responsible for some of the information in this. Uh, what's right is his and what's wrong I'll take credit for. It. This, this is Milton Orchin when he was working at the Bureau of Mines. Uh, next. This is a picture of their hydroformulation lab at that time. Uh, rather elementary, rudimentary by today's standards, but at least they put it in a, a room that they could shut the door and if it went off, uh, it stayed in the room or through the roof. Uh, this gives some feeling of Robert Anderson. Uh, and he uh, pointed out uh, with the election in 1952, uh, the Republic administration changed research at Brewston. In other words, they cut out funding for direct and indirect liquefaction. I, he says that uh, the other maladies that led to the essentially the death of research at the Bureau of Mines might have been apparent to a careful observer. He, he wasn't too careful. It took him about 10 more years before he headed north and went to Canada. I, but I liked his last sentence. Research was becoming increasingly mixed with politics. And he went to I, This is Schlesinger's view uh, that he also credits the Louisiana Purchase, then coal conversion technologies. I, he emphasizes the depression and lack of funding is stopping this. I, then from 36 to 43, this was essentially all direct liquefaction. Uh, at the Bureau of Mines, direct liquefaction was much more successful and received much more funding than did indirect liquefaction. Uh, so all of the work done this period was essentially on direct liquefaction. Uh, the thing that really started the U.S. was the Synthetic Liquid Fuels Act, which appropriated about over $80 million over an 11-year period. Now, $80 million at that time was real money, so you're talking $800 million or more 
today. And so they received significant funding, and this was the highlight of the Bureau of Mines was in this period. I, the Office of Coal Research, this was more toward mining and selling coal. Research by this time was de-emphasized tremendously. Then in 75, Bureau of Mines disappeared and IRTA appeared, and that didn't last very long, and DOE appeared, and response to the energy crisis. So I will stop with the heyday of the Bureau of Mines. I, this annual report in 1928, they said the synthetic motor fuels equipment had been developed and they were ready to start testing. They didn't get to do much testing before the depression came and lack of money stopped it. I, these are three papers that are forwarded cover. Three of them are on Fisher Tropes related material. Uh, Smith was the primary person doing the work. As Irving Winder said, the other two authors were uh, machinist and uh, management type, and Smith was the one who actually did the work. Uh, the mechanism, he uh, indicated that olefins were really important in Fisher Tropes products. Uh, the early work by Fisher emphasized paraffins and the oxygenates. I, he got in a debate over uh, the uh, ability of kinetics and e equilibrium with uh, tropes, and tropes responded to one of his criticisms, as I indicated in the paper, in a very easy manner. He didn't get excited like some people do. He just said some of it was right and some of it was wrong, period. Uh, they also worked on gasification, and uh, this is one paper from that time. Uh, this was Smith's argument. Uh, I, I still think Frisch, Fisher gets credited incorrectly with being strong on metal carbide. He did emphasize, he did mention that, but he also mentioned four or five others in his book. And he really didn't reach a conclusion as to which one. And very soon he was talking more like it was uh, uh, the surface metal carbide. But nevertheless, in history, he's blamed, if you will, for bulk metal carbide hydrogenation. I, he probably discovered uh, hydroformylation before it was discovered by Roland in Germany but didn't recognize that he put a lot of ethylene in and found that he got a lot of oxygen a compact. <clears throat> Furthermore, he thought in the mechanism that these oxygenates form hydrocarbons and maybe even polymerized. <clears throat> and that the iron catalyst was different than the cobalt catalyst. I, I took this from Anthony's paper so that I wouldn't forget to mentioned that he has also written a paper on the Bureau of Mines, and so this reference, if uh, you don't understand <coughs> what I'm saying, he has it right in his paper. I, this is Trope's, or this is Storch. Uh, Storch testified before Congress, and so you can find many, many pages of him testifying before various committees in the 1940s. But his view was that Fisher Tropes reactors, the basic ideas were well understood in the 1940s. And this is a list of the reactors that he was emphasizing the fixed bed, the plate type, and the type that Anthony described from Germany, the fluidized bed. Uh, then oil, and it seems to have weak batteries. So, uh, uh, they, they, they were using two types, and these were essentially done in Germany ahead of this, was the oil circulation and the oil slurry, and then the hot gas recycle. Thanks. I skip this. This is from a DOE report that shows the various types of reactors, and they'd still be good today. Uh, this is a picture of Henry Storch about that time. 
Um, these were the basic research objectives that Henry Stewart outlined for the Bureau. Uh, were metal carbides intermediates in the fissure troughs? Uh, their work led to the oxygenate mechanism where you form the dihydroxy compound on the surface, you eliminate water, and that's the way chain growth occurs. Uh, Emmett and co-workers got carbon-14 tracer studies that supported that and so for about a 20-year period, the oxygenate mechanism was the dominant one in view of fischer tropsch mechanism. Uh, to correlate and expand the knowledge about carbides, and they certainly were successful there. What phases are good FT catalysts? Uh, they wanted to prepare high surface area of these uh, and then to investigate those phases that were untried. Next. <coughs> That's a duplicate. <coughs> uh, fluidized bed was not studied at the Bureau. The main reason was because uh, they were developing the fixed fluid bed commercial scale reactor at Brownsville, Texas. Uh, that reactor uh, <coughs> was, was Politics before Anderson said it had an impact. Uh, Kellogg was working on this with Amico, and one day Kellogg got a letter, don't spend any more money except shipping the records to us and to quit working on this. Uh, Kellogg at that time was owned by Kellogg, so he didn't like being throw, thrown out and giving HRI, which is now HTI, the Project. So he developed his own uh, fluid bed reactor, which turned out to be the circulated fluid bed reactor. Well, what the Bureau did work on was oil circulation, uh, the slurry reactor, and the hot gas recycle. The oil circulation was the one that they got all the way to the big pile of oil. Yes. Where they had great success was in defining the active catalyst phase. I, the cobalt and nickel carbide they found to be slightly inactive. Uh, one reason uh, Hugh Taylor was the dean of catalysis and he gave the impression that only <coughs> those metals that form carbide are active Fischer-Crofts catalysts. And uh, this pretty much eliminated that cobalt carbide was a good catalyst. I, the thermomagnetic was a catalyst characterization at that time, especially for iron catalysts, uh, the crystallographic, and uh, they uh, did a, a lot of work on what is the active phase. They went through catalysts, they characterized them, would be advanced equipment that day, and they decided that all of the carbide phases were active. Uh, this last one, I think, is where they got hung up on. The iron nitrides and carbonitrides were good catalysts with long life and had a different selectivity than iron. And like any organization, I think they wanted to develop their own catalyst, their own process, and so they forced this iron nitride into many situations where they probably would have done better if they would have forgotten about it, but organizations, big organizations, they didn't. And so a lot of the work was done on our nitride. Uh, when, with Mossbauer, uh, nitride isn't around very long, and it very quickly becomes carbonitride and then iron carbide. So uh, it's not stable for long term. This is a picture of their catalyst that with time on stream. They start out and another of their problems was trying to hold catalysts together in the reactor so that they use fused catalysts. They end up using the synthetic ammonia iron catalyst. Uh, they start out reduced, the only way to activate it was hydrogen, so it's almost pure iron, low surface area, and then it turns to iron carbide and the oxide with time. Uh, if you look at the uh, publication by 
Professor Dry, you'll see a similar figure for uh, the composition of iron catalyst from high temperature. Uh, this is a dominant view of Fisher Tropes catalyst, iron catalyst, and people should remember this is correct for high temperature, but low temperature, I don't think it is correct that the iron is converted to carbide and you don't have the metallic iron in the low temperature, high surface area catalyst. They did discover the formation of carbon fibers. This is from one of their reports, but it didn't reproduce very well. But the iron particles make the typical carbon fibers that everyone is making today. And so they were well aware of problems with iron catalysts, uh, making carbon fibers. Uh, this was uh, TEM and by 1950, and Sasol became very much aware of this through the years with the high temperature. I, this is a plot of the products from their cobalt catalyst. Uh, the cobalt they used in the slurry catalyst uh, reactor, but only for the break-in period, and then they switched to the iron catalyst, again because they wanted to make gasoline, and not necessarily diesel. At that time, gasoline was what they needed. Uh, this is a summary of the view that was developed at uh, Euro Mines in the 50s. I think it's still correct today that the outer surface is the carbide. It doesn't matter what the inner surface is. Uh, initially, at low temperature, it starts out carbide. Uh, at high temperature, it starts out iron. Uh, with time, the iron converts to Fe304 whether it's the carbide or the metallic iron, and so you have, I think, a core, which is essentially an inert support. So it doesn't matter what it is. The outer layer is the carbide, which is the active catalyst for Fisher Cross. Uh, well, let's get this, Keith Hall. Uh, in addition to the oxygenate, uh, Bob Anderson developed a model for forming branch products. And his model was 90 of each carbon number, 90% goes on to form a normal, 10% goes to a branch. And he spent a lot of time modeling this, defending it, debating it. Uh, this was put in there only to indicate how the popular topic of the time, everyone tries to fit in the hot topic. At this time, uh, Pauling was pushing the D-electron theory, and so they want to get D-electrons involved in their mechanism so that they have the modern view. And so there is great emphasis on D-band electrons in the 1950s and catalysis and the Bureau picked it up. This is the reactor that they did all the catalyst screening in. <clears throat> they uh, set up uh, 16 of these, and these were the fixed bed, uh, 0.625 ID uh, reactor with the catalyst supported on uh, the wire mesh. Uh, <coughs> they did routine tests, and they normally ran for four to six weeks. So they. And there was a reason for this. The, the induction period that they, or the activation they used had a, up to a week or more induction period. So the first week they were developing the activity. And so it is difficult to activate these low surface area materials. This is a picture of the reactor. Uh, it's an inner tube. The outer tube, the temperature is controlled by the boiling fluid that they put in there and the overpressure that they put on that boiling fluid. I, this is a, doesn't show up very well. It's a uh, cubicle with the standard reactor in it. I, this one is out of place, but uh, this is the <coughs> catalyst reduction unit at the Bureau of Mines demonstration plant at uh, Louisiana, Missouri. 
I, I have found they do have records of this plant at the uh, National Archive in St. Louis. Uh, they list it as eight feet, and it's about ten times that amount. And so hopefully I'll get there sometime. But looking at someone else's lab notebooks is very difficult to make sense. Next. I, this is the test, and uh, all through this, uh, uh, people who are safety minded now would get all excited. No, uh, most of them aren't wearing safety glasses or paying attention to safety equipment, but uh, that was the way it was then. Uh, this is just another view of the test reactors in the lab. Uh, these look, I, I went back to the original. Uh, these look better in the uh, original, but it's not on very good paper, so that even the originals, the pictures are fading rapidly. Uh, they, they were running off a cylinder hydrogen and CO, so that uh, I shudder to think how often they had to change those cylinders. Uh, we put them in series, and you still have to change them every day until we go to tube trailers. So. This is the barrel per day pilot plant. Uh, this was at Grouston, so that they were up to a barrel per day pilot plant. Uh, the control panel, again, the pressure gauges, big pressure gauges. Uh, this is the small bench scale test unit. Uh, I assume this woman wore glasses and it uh, was just an accident that she had safety glasses on because most of them don't. Uh, the distillation uh, to characterize the Fisher Tropes products. Now the process, one that they really worked on in the lab was the oil circulation process and this is really a version of this they took to Louisiana, Missouri. It was run in the liquid phase. The catalyst they were using was the old fused iron. Uh, any of you have used, it's the same one as C73 that uh, a lot of work was done on by Satterfield and us and others. Uh, you stop the stir, it just sinks like a rock. So the gas wouldn't suspend it, and so they recycled oil as well as the gas to keep the catalyst suspended. <coughs> this is a flow diagram taken from one of their reports. I, the, the reactor they're using, in this case, in the uh, pilot plant, they're using the liquid to maintain uh, the constant temperature. There's nothing unique about it. Uh, if you were going to do one today, you'd make it similar, but you'd automate it instead of put the big pressure gauges all over the place. The oil uh, circulation process, I say they pelleted precipitated catalyst, uh, but these disintegrated. And so they were never able to operate with that. And that's why they went to the fused ammonia type catalyst. Uh, these are massive lumps of iron. Uh, the core <coughs> stays iron for a long, long time and is representative of the high temperature that you would see. Uh, the catalyst particles, when they ran them in the fixed bed cemented together or even in the oil circulation, they got hot spots. Uh, so they switched to the expanded bed where they're using oil to expand the bed. Uh, it's very much like the H oil catalyst or the H coal catalyst system. Uh, you use both gas and liquid recirculation to keep the catalyst suspended. <coughs> <coughs> and there they were able to operate for two to three months without disintegration of the catalyst. Uh, they, uh, more durable catalysts were needed, so they went out and they got the iron shot or the steel lathe turnings. Uh, they found that these could be operated in the oil recirculation and that they held together. Uh, they developed it in the three and the eight inch reactors and according to them when the money had disappeared they had developed this. So 
I don't know whether it was the need to have some success for uh, having spent all this money or whether they actually had developed it. The slurry process. Um, this one didn't make it to uh, the Louisiana and Missouri demonstration, but they ran a lot of it in the lab at Brewston. I, I say they started out with the cobalt catalyst, but then they switched to the iron catalyst for most of the work. I, they were using the three inch uh, pilot plant with a 10 foot high slurry. Uh, they also used the eight inch one. Uh, they preferred to activate the iron catalyst with synthesis gas of atmospheric pressure. Uh, the synthesis conditions are given there and they're typical perhaps a little higher at uh, 270 degrees centigrade than liquid phase would be run at Sassol, but, uh, and the space velocity, I assume, at Sassol is higher than this because the ammonia catalyst was a great catalyst, but it was very low activity. And so if you look at the activity of today's precipitated catalyst, there has been about a 1% increase per year on the average of activity of the catalyst over what the Bureau of Mines had in 1950. So that uh, there has been improvement in catalysts, but the separation is still a problem with the iron catalyst. Yeah. It was for them. Uh, go ahead. This is the flow diagram of their slurry, and I say they uh, were, uh, in this case, in some instances, in many instances, it really was slurry very similar to the H oil because they were circulating oil, and in many of the runs, they used the boiling of the solvent to maintain temperature, so they would recycle the distillate to keep the liquid level. They were running what we consider low alpha catalyst. And so with the gas flow they had, they could deplete the liquid level in the reactor. And so they would re return the naphtha to the reactor. I, in the Brewston facility, they conducted 124 experiments. I say the first 10 were with the cobalt, and then they switched to iron. I, they, they ran at very high uh, catalyst loadings, uh, 500 grams per uh, liter of slurry. Uh, they were running at conditions that you would use for coal liquefaction, and so uh, the conditions given, uh, they could vary liquid aerospace velocity over a wide range, and they concluded for the slurry phase that the gas flow, the lower limit would be the minimum you need to suspend the catalyst. And the maximum was where either frothing or slugging or whatever disturbed the oil phase. I, they also said that additives may aid in suspending the catalyst. Whether that additive was the oxygenate that was made in the process or whether it's something you added they use both. Uh, they studied reactor design. Uh, they even, and I suspect this, because the Germans had done this, uh, where they put the tube, uh, concentric tube down, uh, it would now be somewhere at least to a downcomer, uh, except they were using it to put the gas in so it would go to the bottom and it would be preheated. Uh, in the larger reactors, they used external recycle where they were actually separating catalyst in the, or separating wax from the slurry in the external recycle lab. So that uh, it's somewhat analogous in scientific terms, not necessarily in patent terms, to what mobile use for their uh, pilot plant and what you see a lot of patents to that. Uh, but uh, they were using it. Uh, 
They also used pumps to recirculate the outer leg, but they wore out very rapidly. Uh, and they didn't find any variation, whether they countercurrent or concurrent flow. This is a picture, and I don't know what my time is. Okay. This is an overview uh, of the Louisiana Missouri plant while it was being constructed. The synthesis gas unit is in the upper right. On the left is direct coal liquefaction facilities. I, this is coal and ground coal looks the same in 1950 in Missouri as it does today in Kentucky. Uh, not included in this, but at Morgantown in Pittsburgh, they did a lot of work on gasification. Uh, they used the oxygen gasification at the Lindy, Missouri plant. However, most of the synthesis gas was generated from char and not from gasification. They had operational problems with the gasifier, and uh, they later worked them out, but that was after the Missouri plant was closed. Gas cleanup, they did a lot of work on, and even did it at uh, Missouri. They used the siphon and then uh, water scrub. Uh, they then compressed it and removed the CO2 and H2S. I, the reactor was three foot diameter or 30 uh, foot tall. Uh, at the bottom, they supported the catalyst on uh, one foot <coughs> high steel balls. And that served also to uh, disperse the gas so that the gas would enter below the steel balls. And the, uh, they had 15 foot of catalyst slurry and it was 14,000 pounds of catalyst. Uh, this made uh, 70 to 100 barrels of product a day. I, the direct liquefaction plant, they started much earlier, they ran much more and it was 200 barrels a day. Uh, the gas flow, uh, they recycle about 50% 50, 50 of the feed was recycled. Uh, and they claim that they got 50% of the gas feed dissolved in the oil, which seems high, but that was what they said. Uh, in their slurry reactor, they got a maximum temperature rise of 14 degrees centigrade. They operate with a bed expansion and of 20-30%, and this was again because of recycle of liquid as well as gas. Uh, the product was mainly gasoline. Now, this one I included only because uh, that uh, they say that when you get about 80% wax, it will become stable. And presumably, uh, this is because of mass action effect. Now, I don't really understand what they were saying. Uh, although, uh, Keppel made a uh, uh, similar claim that the paraffins would reincorporate and react. Uh, I assume here they're saying if you get 80% wax that uh, mass action keeps you from forming more. I don't see how that could be, but uh, that was in this report. Okay. Uh, th this is the sum of the Fisher tropes, and since he says I'm getting close, we'll stop uh, at this one. They only made four successful runs in the, the so-called slurry phase at the demonstration plant. Although the slurry phase really used recycled, so it was like the HLF. I, they obtained conversions of 84% at a low gas hourly space velocity of 480, and at an even lower one of 370, they got 92%. The catalyst disintegrated. Uh, they were using 
a precipitated but fuse catalyst. I, they were recycling and so they were happy when they had a 12% ash in the recycle except it were to pump out but it increased the productivity. So that nature is, re, it is activating their catalyst by increasing the surface area by attrition and uh, it gave them better conversion until they couldn't pump it anymore. Uh, and the maximum production they got during the high yield. And with that, I will say that that was the beginning of the downfall of the Bureau of Mines uh, from 1960 on. It really didn't do very much in the way of Fisher Tropes. Uh, many people left, but from the, their start through 1960, they were extremely successful. They compete. They had the one that would compete with, if not be superior, to any lab in the world at that time for Fisher Tropes research, as well as heavy oil upgrading and direct coal liquefaction. But the U.S. gave up. South Africa didn't, and so now it's Sasol instead of U.S. FT or whatever that dominates the Fisher Tropes. Thing. Okay. Thank you, Bert. Unfortunately, it looks like Bert uh, decided he didn't want to ask any questions. So <laughs> we'll have to, uh, we're getting a little bit into the